Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for coming today, especially on the last day of conference. I'm glad you all made it and didn't fly out early, so thank you for being here. Um, this talk is rec Dynamic Recursive Heterogeneous Types and Statically Typed Languages. This is uh, some work I've done with my co-presenter Clint Jeffrey over here. Um, that, that's Clint right there, the guy waving. Um, this work is kind of a cross between uh, some software engineering work and a little bit of programming languages work, but it's expressible in the beauty of C++, um, which is why this is the perfect place for this, for this discussion. Okay, so it's a really awful title for a talk, like, I'm sure you all had to look at the abstract, like, what on earth is he talking about? This talk is really about trying to bring Python dictionaries, or at least the ease um, and the simplicity of Python dictionaries into C++. If you've ever done anything with Python, you know that dictionaries are really, really easy and really, really uh, almost fun to use. Um, and so we're going to talk about how we can maybe translate some of this into C++. Okay. Uh, um, it's not just all about Python, of course. Um, most dynamic languages have some notion of a dictionary of key value pairs. There's the Python dictionary, which we're going to emphasize. There's the Unicon icon table. That's one of the reasons my uh, co-presenter is so interested. He is the current curator of the Unicon programming language. Uh, Lua tables, JavaScript tables, the Ruby hash. And if you've ever done anything with any of these dynamic languages, you're like, you know, the dictionary really is easy to use. I remember the first time I actually learned Icon, I was sitting in a classroom, the, uh, uh, Ralph Griswold was teaching all, us all about dictionaries, and I'm like, this is really great. I, I was just remember, they had this gestalt moment of like, wow, I really like dictionaries. Um, and there was something that sort of carried on with me through my career, okay? So the dictionary is really easy to you, use. It's a key value store. You associate keys with values. Here's how you create a dictionary or a dictionary literal in Python. Uh, the keys are A, B, and C. And if you wanted to get the value associated with the key A, you say, do you do the bracket notation, D sub A, and you get out the value one. Okay, there's not really an equivalent in C++, there sort of is. Uh, we're going to kind of go through the steps to make it so that we can get very similar syntax in Python as we have in, uh, sorry, in C++ as we have in Python. Okay, and this is the part that I, I think is interesting. We can add something like the dictionary to C++. The dictionary is all about being dynamic, but paradoxically, we're going to use the static features of C++ to make dynamic features easier to use. Crazy, huh? You're going to use all these great static features that come with C++, but it's going to make this very dynamic structure simple to use. So crazy. We're going to take advantage of static function overloading, static operator overloading, static user-defined uh, conversion, static type selection and inference. All static features to make something dynamic easy to express. Crazy. Okay. So why Python dictionaries? Um, one of the goals uh, of this talk is we want to make dynamic recursive heterogeneous dictionaries, don't worry, we'll define what all those terms mean in a second, as easy to use in C++ as in Python. So um, I have two reasons here, one's not on the slide, but uh, the one on the slide is most major projects span multiple languages. If you're going out in an industry and you're going to work on something, you're not probably not going to just use C++, you're probably going to use some Perl scripts or some Python scripts or something to put stuff together. And the way we, we sort of uh, work at Rincon is we use scripting languages like Python, JavaScript, or Ruby to be the front end of our application. We take all these components that are written in C++ and sort of glue them together. Uh, the components we use at our company are for digital signal processing algorithms, and they tend to be, have to be written in C or C++, or this, there's this language called Fortran um, that a lot of my engineers use. And they have to be written in these languages because we need the speed that these um, uh, static languages provide. So the scripting languages like Python provide the front end and allow us to glue stuff together. The high performance languages, Fortran, C, or C++, form the hardcore back end where we do all the major processing. Okay? And so if you have a system that's composed of dynamic languages and static languages, we need a currency, and that's what the Python dictionary becomes. If we need to communicate something from um, um, this, the front end to the back end, we need some currency uh, between the two systems so they can talk to each other. Okay? So that's sort of one major reason why we like Python dictionaries so much. Uh, another reason goes to a paper that was published in IEEE Computer back in 2001, so it's a, it's a bit dated, but to my knowledge it's one, of the more, um, um, it's one of the more scientific efforts to try to compare 
why, are so, why do we prefer some languages for different problems and what do we see? Um, it, it really tried to compare um, uh, what it was like to write a program, the same problem in different programming languages and what, and what, the, what some of the results were. And one of their main results, it was kind of a minor result in the paper, it was a paragraph, but they said, you know, everybody who um, solved a problem in Python, they tended to all leverage the dictionary very heavily. It's like all the Python programmers um, knew this data structure existed and they all relied on it heavily to solve the problem in the paper. And so that, that's sort of, um, go ahead, is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. So this was sort of, you know, this was a let, vaguely scientific uh, notion that, you know, Python dictionaries are very important and they do make some problems very easy to solve. Yes, sir? It's the same thing, I mean, maybe you have it right there, but it's the same thing in Lua. I mean, Lua is a whole language built on tables. It's pretty much the same thing. We're, we're going to tell, oh, uh, the, please repeat the question. Um, uh, Lua, he, uh, uh, Alex is pointing out that Lua is all about di uh, tables and dictionaries too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, hello. So here's kind of an outline where we're going. Um, I want to talk a little about history and lessons learned. I've actually been messing with dynamic uh, heterogeneous dictionaries for a long time. Yes, I'm an old fart, I admit it. Uh, we're going to talk about the Valtab array framework um, and how we use the static features in the language. Um, we'll do a quick comparison to boost any type. I, I learned a lot from Alex's talk the other day about uh, different things that are very qu uh, equivalent to this, so uh, hopefully Alex and I can have a conversation after this. And then kind of conclude how all this fits together and why you hopefully could find it useful. Okay, so what do I mean when I say it's dynamically typed? When we talk about a dynamically typed language, the type of the variable is determined by the value in the variable at runtime. So in um, Python, Ruby, Lisp, Unicon are all dynamically typed languages. So right here, we put an end in here. Nope, then we immediately put a 2.2, a real value. Nope, then we put a string. You don't know what is inside a variable until you look at it at runtime. The type is dynamic, and what's inside it is bound at runtime. That's what we mean when we say dynamically typed language. Compare that, of course, to our favorite language, C++, a statically typed language where the type of the variable is bound at compile time. That variable can only hold values of that type. Okay? So I list um, statically typed languages in order left to right of more, most statically typed to least statically typed, Fortran, C, C++, Java are all statically typed languages, but of course C++ and Java have the notion of virtual, so there's a little bit of dynamic dynamicity there. Okay, so I don't even know why I'm giving this example. This is a C++ conference, but if you say int a equals one, you can't really give it another kind of value because at compile time, a can only contain integers. Okay, so what do I mean by heterogeneous versus homogeneous? You usually apply this, uh, this term to containers. So a container is heterogeneous if it can hold more than one type. A container is homogeneous if it can contain only one type. So C++ containers are generally homogeneous. If you have a vector uh, of ints, this, can only, this vector can only contain integers. So notice I'm using some C++11 syntax here. Ah, ah, C++11. Uh, it's an array type for ints only. And we do have the notion, uh, this is probably the first thing you thought when I said, we don't have dictionaries in C++. You probably first went to think, yeah, we do. We sort of do with map, right, Rich? We'll see that they're a little bit different creatures. The map is a key value dictionary, but it can only map strings to ints. It's templatized on the key and the value, and inside that container, it must always be strings and ints. Okay? Yes, sir? What about like we're going to talk about any at the end of the talk. I'm just, this is sort of like um, generic. Oh, please repeat the question. What about any? We're going to talk about it later. So we will come back to that. Python containers are heterogeneous, okay? Um, the array type, this is the equivalent to a vector in uh, um, C++. And notice that we can have an integer, a float, a string, all in the same list here. They actually, in Python, they call it a list, not an array type, but uh, and here's a dictionary. It's kind of similar to what we have for the map, but this is, notice that the values here are heterogeneous, string, float, and an int. So when we say heterogeneous, we mean we can kind of put whatever the heck we want into it. And I think that might be the appeal of the, the dictionary. You don't have to necessarily think ahead, what am I going to put in there? Oh, I can just put stuff in there when I need to. And that might be one of the reasons the Preckle paper of 2001 sort of found that Python programmers really tended to like the dictionary. 
Okay, so what I mean recursive, in this sense we're referring it more to the containers. Basically containers can contain containers. So in our case here's a Python dictionary which contains, associated with the key C, is the dictionary D in one. Okay, and this is kind of an extension of the heterogene heterogeneity concept. We can, um, we can hold any kind of thing inside of container, but what's kind of more important is how well does the language support nested nesting these types, okay? So in Python, it's trivial. Actually, there's a typo on this slide. This should be C here. It's, it's trivial to access that nested container. If it's like, what, I want the, this integer right here, this one. How do I get it? I say D sub C sub A. Got it, done. How do you do this in C++? We'll see that this is, can be hard using the any. Okay. Yes, sir. The, to answer that question, the, the, the problem with any is once you try to retrieve the value out, you don't know what's in there. So you end up with a lot of trouble. But you have to put it in. All right. Um, Let's talk a little bit of history or how I became obsessed with dynamic types in C++. In 1996, yes, this is a very long time ago, uh, I worked on a, a, a C++ infrastructure for doing digital signal processing called Midas 2K. It was a technical success in that we were able to make, build systems across the world. There's probably 100,000 systems um, uh, I know of that were built and deployed. However, it's a political failure. Gee, what a surprise, politics killed something. I, I'm shocked and surprised by that. Okay, but it was a technical success. The reason this was, um, one of the things I want to point out here, something, um, it's a prism that sort of guides almost all the stuff you'll see here. I work with engineers. I am a computer scientist working with a bunch of physicists, PhD physicists, PhDs in electrical engineering, PhDs in, uh, in math and applied math. So to them, their job is to just get a system that works done. They're actually pretty good programmers in general. But to them, as soon as you start looking at too much computer science, they're like, dude, why are you doing all that? I, all I want to do is an if there. Why are you doing all this stuff with virtual? And they, they sometimes don't get all the stuff that we need to make you know, easy code and easily maintainable code in C++. So there's, there's always this tension. I want to make something as easy for the engineer to use as possible. And that's going to frame every one of my decisions here. This work is all about the interface. I want to make the engineer's life as easy as possible so that they don't call me up at three in the morning or call me up and say, hey, Rich, your code's broken, come fix it. It's like, no, you just forgot to do this. I'm trying to make it so that the engineer doesn't have to call me and they can get their job done, okay? So that, with, with that thought in mind, the interface is, is paramount. Let's move forward, okay? So like I said, this M2K framework was a major success. Even though it was canceled, it was one of those, there was, they kind of said, well, th we have this framework with all these successful things. What's good about it? What do we want to keep? And the number one thing on everyone's list was something called opal values and opal tables. And what are opal values and opal tables? It's just like essentially the any type and the map with any's in it. Okay? So this is the first place I saw dynamic types, way back in 1996. So an opal value was a dynamic container for containing any basic type or table. Um, it was a recursive heterogeneous key value container, so you could create an opal table here. Yes, this is horrible syntax. A equals one, B equals two, so the keys are A and B. The values are one and 2.2, and if you wanted to get a value out, you had to say ot.get. Okay? The keys are strings, and the values are opal uh, values, which are heterogeneous, but they can also be tables as well, so this is recursive. Why was this a success? The engineers seemed to really love this. They loved the idea that they could, in general, pass these opal tables around to all parts of the system. I don't care whether it's a string or an int, because I just want to pass this along. They seemed to really, they seemed to really dig it. Okay? And so this was a, a useful list on, as a feature to migrate to new systems. Uh, one of the other successes of the, um, that, that the engineers seemed to really like is that it had both a textual and a binary expression. You saw the textual expression, it's kind of, uh, eh, it's okay. But um, you could also save it in fast binary form. We'll see why this decision is important later on. 
Okay, so what were the failures? This is the thing where you're like, oh, you started looking at the code the engineers wrote, and like, well, this is the interface I gave them, but the more I look at their code, it kind of puts a little knot in my stomach. This is ugly. So for example, if I wanted to create a string to put inside there, I had to call this macro opalize, blah. But I didn't have to call opalize for an opal table. And if I wanted to do something with plain integers, one, two, three, reals, floats, complexes, I had to go through an extra number class. So it wasn't consistent. You sometimes needed opalize. It was wordy. This is awful. The more the code I saw written like this, the more like, we, there's got to be a better way. Yes, sir? What's the real underscore 8 do? Uh, that creates, um, oh, uh, what, what does the real underscore 8 do? That creates a double. My, my engineers really like the Fortran style of talking about integers and reals. So uh, what they, the, the way you specify a double in Fortran is you say uh, real underscore 8. It's an 8 byte. Uh, float and then the real underscore four will be a, uh, a floating point in, in, the, in Sibley. Okay. Extraction was terrible too. In order to get a value out, you had to do this thing called unopalize. Again, you're like, you see all this in your engineer's code, like, there's got to be a better way. So the number was a mistake. Going through a special number class just to hold integers and floats and complex numbers, mistake. Okay. But it did teach us something which we'll see later, I promise. Okay, another failure was the textual representation was non-standard. We created this thing, the opal value syntax, and you know, we'd get new engineers, we'd hire new engineers, and they're like, what is this syntax? You can sort of grok it after a while, but it's not really consistent. There's no other system in the world that uses this syntax to create dictionaries. So they're like, okay, we can learn it. That's fine. We're engineers. We can get by with it. And remember, this was a long time ago. Remember, that's one of the reasons I put up the date, 1996. This was sort of pre-JSON, kind of pre-XML-ish area. These things hadn't really taken off yet. So there wasn't really a standard representation for dictionaries, okay? This is another failure. We really should distinguish between lists and arrays. That seemed to be something that always got in the way. Okay. So the lessons of M2K. Extraction insertion, they really should be trivial. An extra number class, huge mistake. If you want to pull out an if you want to pull out an integer, you had to first pull out a number and then pull out an integer. Mistake. Use standard textual representation. So if you get an engineer who knows, let's say Lua tables or Python dictionaries, they can immediately attack and use the stuff. Okay? There was a holistic lesson you learned, and I'm sure everyone who's done anything with large systems has already learned this lesson. You have to be a little bit careful with overloading. If you have a lot of overloads, sometimes if you pass the wrong argument in, you know, your compiler's going to complain saying, did you mean this overload? 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 And that was one of the things I didn't want my engineers to see, because as soon as they see that, they're like, Rich, your code's broke. Tell me what's wrong. Just, just put an int there and it'll work. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, go back to work. Thanks, Rich. So, right, so we had to, this is a holistic lesson we learned. We have to be really careful when we're doing overloading, because conversions can interact in strange ways. All right, so after M2K got canceled, we kind of looked around and we said, hey, there's this thing called Python, which seems to be really taking off. And uh, let's take a look and start using it. And wow, we, we, our company really liked Python. We liked the syntax. We liked all the libraries that came with it. We really, if we wanted a scripting language, not our own homemade scripting language, that was one of the things we did wrong also in M2K. We wanted to use a scripting language that was a lot of people were using so we could leverage all the work that's already been done. So when we started using Python, dic Python and Python dictionaries, it's like, wow, they really got dynamic recursive heterogeneous types right. It's like, it's really easy to do stuff with dictionaries in Python. Okay, so this is kind of what uh, some, uh, some simple manipulations in Python. You can create the dynamic values easily, simply assign different values in. You can create the heterogeneous types, right? Here we have A is one, and we have another type here is the nested dictionary. And then we can also do both lookups, uh, recursive cascading lookups, and inserts if we have dictionaries inside dictionaries. It's really easy to do all this stuff in Python. Okay, so what were the lessons from um, embracing Python? We were like, you know what? We had our own dictionary, but we should use something like Python. They've already got one. Everybody seems to like it. 
we hire a whole bunch of um, engineers, a whole bunch of young kids out of Rose Holman and some other schools around the country. And you know, every time we bring them in, so they start on projects, they love Python. They're like, oh, this is great. We can do most of our work in Python and then just have a few things to do, the CAFs and the DSP kind of stuff in C++. They love Python. The engineers coming out absolutely adore it. Okay, because they like it because it's easy to use and it's very easy to, uh, to come up to speed with quickly. Okay, and I think one of the reasons that dictionaries are so easy to use in Python is because almost all of the major constructs, the namespace constructs, are implemented using the dict. Okay, the class, the Python class, you know, every, every language now these days has to have a class. It's implemented underneath the covers using the Python dict. The module system is implemented using the dict, okay? I think because of the ubiquity of the dictionary, I think it's sort of created this razor sharp sword. It's like, we're only going to use the best parts of the dictionary. We're gonna make it easy to use as possible because it's everywhere. We need to make sure that the dictionary is easy to use and fast because it's all endemic to the language, okay? The textual format of the Python dictionary is a standard. Python is pretty darn widely used. Outside of Lester's door where I work, he has a, a list of all the languages and their popularity and their growing. And Python's usually in the top four. It's, it's a very popular language. So we like the notion of the Python dictionary because it's, it's very much out there. And if you've ever done any looking at JSON, JSON and Python dictionaries are like, they're like twin brothers who one of them got caught in an accident or something like that. They're so very close to each other. The only real difference is pretty much how they do uh, um, quotes and also uh, the true, false, and the null. But other than that, they're almost exactly the same syntax. Okay? So that's another reason we sort of embraced the Python. Why did we not embrace the JSON? Partly because I don't think we actually knew much about it. It may not have actually had its hold in the industry at that point. But the other reason, we had the love affair with Python. We loved Python. We loved the Python dictionary. We were going to use it everywhere. Okay. All right. Remember the first time you learned inheritance? It was the coolest thing ever. You wanted to use it for everything in the world. Oh, we can do this with inheritance. We can do this with inheritance. We can do this with inheritance. And then you kind of step back a few months later like, Oh, that's probably, we shouldn't use inheritance everywhere. It's a tool that makes our life very easy. And we should probably just use it in more limited context. So that's sort of my, how my company was about Python. As soon as we found Python, oh, we gotta use it everywhere. We'll use it here, we'll use it here, we'll use it here, we'll use it here. And then you kind of step back and say, you probably shouldn't use it in all of those places, okay? So the third version of dynamic vowels is what we want to do is we love Python so much, we attached a Python interpreter we embedded a Python interpreter to a lot of our C++ apps, and sometimes that made sense, but most of the time it didn't. And so what we did is we had a new dynamic type of var, and all we simply did was we wrapped, um, we, we wrapped an operation, and we deferred to the Python interpreter if we wanted to do anything dynamic, and then get the value out and send it back to C++, okay? And like I said, this was one of those things where it probably was a bad idea, it was a failure because you always required a Python interpreter. And if you haven't done much with embedding a Python interpreter, it can actually be pretty large as part of your, uh, your, final, um, your final executable. So it didn't necessarily make sense. Um, one of the major successes is that the var got cascading inserts and lookups right. First time I saw it, I'm like, that's what we should have been doing all along. Okay. One of the failures of, of this system was the extracting info was too wordy, and I don't want to say too much more about that. Okay. So, I saw Opal value, its failures and successes. I saw Python, its failures and successes. I saw the VAR stuff we did with Python, its failures and successes. And I'd like to think I learned the hit lessons of history. What things looked good, what things looked awful. Can I use this to make a better dynamic value, okay? And what we came up with is the holy trinity of the val, the tab, and the r. The val is the dynamic, val uh, the dynamic value can hold basic things. The tab is the Python dict. Yes, I know, I should have called it dict because that's what Python called it. And then the R is the list. I didn't like list because I really wanted to emphasize it was a resizing array. And whenever I hear list, I'm old school. I think list, list processing with dot link list. So I wanted to really emphasize it was an array. Okay. So if this is what your Python looks like, 
This is what your C++ is going to look like. We can create the dynamic values here, create the dictionary, and do recursive cascading lookups and inserts. In C++, we can do the same stuff. Put dynamic values in, create dictionaries with literals that has the same syntax as Python. We want to reuse. We don't want to have a stovetop cons uh, stovepipe construction for how we uh, specify dictionaries. And we're able to do a lookup and an insert into this nested dictionary. Eh? 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 So there we go. We have the ability to express Python dictionaries in C++. Okay? So you're probably wondering, well, that's really cool. How did you do it? So the rest of this talk is about some of the implementation details of how, how this fits together. Okay? So the basics are the val. Every variable in C++, of course, must have a static type. We're in a statically typed language. We will use the val as the type for representing dynamic values. For those of you who are familiar with C sharp, think of dynamic. For those of you who saw Alex's talk, also think dynamic or var, uh, some of the stuff he used. Very similar, think any if you're familiar with that. Okay? So val is a very simple dynamic container. It can only contain these types. It cannot contain arbitrary types, which we will discuss later. I know someone's going to ask about it. We will uh, talk about this. It's more like JSON in, in, in the, uh, what was it called? The, the folly, dynamic. Uh, folly dynamic, right? It's much more like that than the any work, okay? So we can put strings, dictionaries, and any primitive types, ints, reals, and complex numbers. Complex numbers are very important to my engineers because we do DSP, okay? So how do you do it? The first part, this part's easy. It's like, oh, that's, that's, that's really easy. How do you make it so that you can create a val out of anything? You simply overload the constructor on all the basic types that you may want to put in there, okay? So if you want to create an int, you have one constructor that takes an int. If you want to create a double, you have one constructor that takes a double. If you want to create a floating point number, you have one constructor that takes, and so on, okay? Yes, sir? We'll get to that. What about user-defined types? We'll get to that. <coughs> OK. So what's the val implementation? It's implemented as a type tag in the union. And you might say, oh my god, that's like so 1980s. Oh my god, gave me with a spoon. Um, but at least I felt better after seeing Alex's talk, because he talked about like the Q variant, how it's essentially a union. So I don't feel quite as bad as saying, yeah, it's implemented as a union. OK. Why did I do it this way? There's a couple reasons. One, I like the union because it's really, it's pretty much 32 bytes. The val doesn't get much bigger than that. You, we have to be able to store a complex 16 in there. Complex 16 has to be a certain amount, so has to be at least that big. And then you have to have a few extra information for tags and so on, okay? Um, the union, go ahead, I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh, I'm, I'm, okay. The union is also thread and free, um, heap friendly. Most of the time you allocate vowels on the stack. You say val v equals this, val v equals this, and you're allocating on the stack. This is one of the minor lessons from M2K. Avoid unnecessary heap allocation. The M2K was a threaded system, and it was all about 50, 100 threads in a single application at one time. And one of the things we learned that a lot of heap allocations that happen in multiple threads can cause collateral damage and really slow down your application. Okay? So I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose my thread neutrality that we had in Opal Values and Opal Tables when we went to this as well. Okay? I have an intentional lack of virtual functions and pointers because I want to be able to use val and cross-process shared memory. Okay, I want to be able to say, hey, I know this resides in cross-process shared memory. As soon as I introduce a V table, I don't know about you, but I have no idea how to make sure the V table in this process and this V table in this process point to the same code. Exactly. <laughs> so this was, this was a minor goal, but it made it so I wanted to make sure I did not have any virtual functions inside my val, because I want to be able to use it in cross-process shared memory. Okay? And so how did we do all this? Like Alex talked about in his talk, we use placement new and manual destructors for things that are not default constructible. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Marshall. So um, that's all great for all your, your, your numeric types. Yes. What about strings? Oh, strings are part of the list. Yeah, but I'm just saying. Most string implementations you know, have a pointer in them. 
Okay, so um, Marshall's question was about uh, what about other strings because they have a pointer in them, but they don't have a virtual pointer in them. That's what I was trying to get away from. I can control data placement in C++, right? Placement new, I can do placement new inside my shared memory, but I can't have, because the V table is all about pointing to code. I can, I can control where the string lives in memory using placement new, and possibly using allocators, but I cannot control where code resides, how the linking process happened. Right, you, you, would, need, you would need some kind of shared memory aware allocator. Yes, yes. For your string type. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, did I, should I repeat the question? His, his question was, what about um, strings? Because strings have pointers inside them, and uh, as long as it's pointing to, uh, pointing to data and not code, you're okay. It was kind of a minor thing, but it really did sort of have an influence on a lot of the stuff inside. All right? So this goes back to the holistic lesson from the M2K days. What if you forget to overload on a type? For example, what if I forgot this overload, okay? And I said valve equals 1.0. Well, what would happen? Y'all know. <laughs> Bunch of compiler output. Did you mean this overload? 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 And he looked at it for a few minutes and said, oh, that's my problem. I need to cast that to something so it'll do correctly. And this is exactly the problem I'm trying to avoid with my engineers. I want to overload on all basic primitive types so my engineers can just put something in a val and they don't have to worry about some cast and getting some obscure error message. I want to make their life as easy as possible. So that's why even though this looks a little clumsy because I have so many overloads, it's all about making my engineer's life easier. Okay. Why did I not use a templatized constructor? We can talk a lot about this, but it really boils down to backwards compatibility. I have users, I know it's hard to believe, back at Red Hat 3 and Red Hat 4, and the compilers weren't quite as good back then, and so I had to make sure that this stuff worked with all my users across all these crazy platforms. I know this is C++11, and sometimes I feel like I'm stuck at C++ arm back with my, for some of the systems we have to support, so. Apologies. Okay, so one of the types that comes up a lot, one of the primitive types that comes up a lot um, when you're doing especially stuff with STL vectors and, and, and your favorite STL activity is the size T. It's the result of a size, size of operation. What is a size T? If you kind of burrow down, look at the standard, whatever, it's basically some unsigned int, but it kind of depends on what machine. Are you on a 32-bit machine or a 64-bit machine? Um, so it may or may not be an int U8 or an int U4. It may, be, it may also be a platform to find it. There was um, one particular or two particular GNU platforms where they actually had a, somewhere like down in atomics.h, somewhere inside the GNU, that it was not any of these ints. GNU sort of had its own special int that the C++ type system considered distinct from every other unsigned int. It was not the same kind of int. Okay, so on some platforms, a size T is the same thing as int U8 or int U4. On others, it was a completely separate unsigned type. Now this isn't the end of the world. If I wanted to say something like valve equals size of blach, that would work fine on systems where int U8 or int U4 was a size T. But it's not gonna work on a system where it's its own distinct type. So you could get around it, by doing this, you could take your whatever came out of size of and convert it to an int U8 or an int U4, fine. But this is one of those things like, this subverts the simplicity for the users. Again, this is all about making my user's life as easy as possible. I don't want to have to force them to go find out why size of didn't work, because size T is everywhere, right? It's the result of your length from a lot of your STL operations. So I want to make sure my, my users can use this easily. So what would you do? In the old days, I remember back in the old days in C, we would use an if def, okay? We would, an if def, if size t was not the same as int u8, we'd create a special constructor, which we overline on size t. And that might have been success, um, that might have been fine and acceptable back in 1980. However, we have to manually check if size t is available or not, and so we'd have to manually manage this macro. So if we moved our system from Red Hat 6 to Red Hat 7 or Fedora Core, and we moved it from a 32-bit to a 64-bit machine, we'd always have to be aware of this macro and maintain it manually. Isn't there a better way? Doesn't C++ have a better way to do this? Okay. So we're gonna use a technique from modern C++ design. Um, 
call type selection. Okay, we're going to introduce a, a new dummy type, which were, is basically pretty un, much unused by the system. OC underscore unused underscore size t, and then we're going to introduce a new constructor called allow underscore size t for val. Okay, basically what we're going to do is if if we notice that size t is a completely unique int type, we're going to type def size t to allow size t. But if it's the same thing as an int u4, we're going to type def it to this unused size. And why do we need to type def it to an unused size? Because we're going to add a new constructor, but if it's the same thing as an int u4, allow, c's t uh, allow size t would conflict with an int u4 uh, co constructor as well. Does that make sense? OK. So this is the basic idea. This is the, at least the idea, sort of, it's a little more complicated because you have to worry about int u8 and int u4 and some other stuff. But the basic idea is you use static features of the language, the static type inference and the static, uh, static type selection. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull out, we're going to type def the result to allow size t. If this size t is the same thing as an int u4, this is the specialization we're going to use, and this is the result we'll pull out, OCN size t. If size t is not the same thing as int u4, what's it going to use? It's going to use the general template where it pulls out size t directly. Okay? So this type def with these two type selections allow us to automatically figure out if allow size t should be size t or unused type. Okay? I know this feels like a lot of work to avoid one single coercion, but again, this is all about interface. I want to make it easy to use for my, inter uh, for my engineers. Congratulations, you've reinvented Enable If. Okay, I, I guess I didn't know about that. Okay. Enable If, I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at that. Okay, so the the point the um, the audience was pointing out that it, you may be, you might be able to do this enable if and there's discussion it's it's not clear but it's definitely worth looking into. Okay, oh and so by the way we also overload operator equal operator equal takes a val so that you can do all these as well. Okay. So what this all we all this work this is a lot of work just to get to the point where we can put anything we want into the vowel. So we've gotten one direction. Now we need to be able to get stuff out of the vowel. This is one of my favorite features in C++, the user-defined conversion, okay? It's a unique feature. I can't say unique. I should actually cross that out because C Sharp has this feature as well. But uh, it has a feature called uh, unique uh, user-defined conversions, which allows a type to export itself as a different type. So for example, if I wanted to have a, uh, an int, which could only take a range of values 0 to 99, okay, I could create a special class called int range. Um, and the operator int here allows this class to export itself as an integer if needed in a particular context. So for example, if I wanted to call this function f, which took an integer, Okay, and I created an int range m and tried to pass that in. A lot of programming languages say, dude, you can't do that because f only takes an int, and int range is obviously not an int. Ah, but the compiler is allowed to, during overload resolution, in one step, if it can say, hey, you know what? I can actually convert this int range to an int in one step using the operator int, which means that this code will compile and work. Really what this is, what this code right here is C++ allows, um, this is syntactic sugar for what's really happening here. We create an int range, it creates a, uh, a temporary outcasted temp from us. By the way, I frequently hear it called outcasting as well as user-defined conversions. And then it calls f with this outcasted int. Okay? Have, have, you guys, have you guys all seen this feature before? Most people have? Okay. I actually remember the first time I read about it was in Rob Murray's book. I'm like, he had a really nice presentation of it. Okay, so you can imagine where I'm going with this. The user-defined conversions with val. This allows us to extract all types from a val with minimal typing. 
The VAL has a user-defined conversion for all the basic types, as well as tabs, Rs, and strings. So if I create a VAL with some value of pi, some approximation of pi, I can just ask for it as a double and get it out. This is syntactic sugar for what's really happening here, is when I ask for it out, it's really calling v dot operator double on val to get out its value. What I want to point out here is the type of the variable informs the conversion so that you don't have to state explicitly which conversion is being used. This type informs why you use this conversion. And it makes sense. Oh, yes, sir, go ahead. So then uh, you're going to have to protect against conversion, right? We'll, we'll talk about that in, on the next slide. But, uh, but one of the things I do want to point out, this is, and it seems like this is the way it should be, right? You don't want to have to go out of your way to specify new types as string, as double, m dot operator double. The type's right there. This is a statically typed language. Why can't, if we're asking for this type, why do we not just get it out? You don't have to type as double, as float, as int. You can just get out the type you need because this is the type you want out. Much less typing than this. Maybe not significantly more. I don't have to do an unopalize. Okay? So to go to your question, um, this is something, oh, yes sir, go ahead. What is your convention if the type doesn't match? What is the convention if the type doesn't match? Okay, principle of leaf surprise. All right, thank you, he was my, so you guys are both my straight man. Okay, so what if the type and the vowel and outcast mismatch? For example, if I put my approximation of pi in here and I ask for it out as an int, what happens? What I do, and this is actually a different philosophy than Alex has for his, his library, is I would do what C++ do if you did an explicit cast, okay? Um, basically, you do a static cast of an int like this, convert it out to an integer, and of course, cast it down to three. There are, of course, casts that don't make any sense. If you want to cast an, uh, a float to a table, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. And what you would do in, in Python is that would actually throw an exception. A lot of times, that's actually another philosophy of this, is um, typically we do this, the principle of least surprise, you do what C would do. But if there's not really an equivalent in C++, we would do what Python does. Yes, sir? Do you have any protection against the undefined behavior of sign, say, a large double to a sign um, Okay, so we're going to take a look. Uh, let's, <coughs> let me repeat the question. Uh, say it one more time, Alistair, please. Do we have any protection against the undefined behavior you would get assigning a large double to a signed integer? So, you've got the undefined behavior so, so by long double, you mean actually the, the 16... We, we, um, so there, there is no, do we have any protection against us uh, finding a long double to uh, like a, a, um, an int? We, don't well, we do not right now. In fact, we don't actually handle long doubles, which is a failing on our part currently. Oh, oh, large double. Um, if there's a question, then we'll do what C++ would do if, with the static cast. If it drops precision, we defer to what C++ would do. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned what we do. What we actually do is, if you try something that doesn't make sense, we will drop. Yes, yes, and that's what we do. But if, if, if there's something that you can convert, then we will convert, but safely making sure that the, you know, the the end can finish the short. Okay. Current, oh, um, uh, Alex was pointing out that his stuff, they do a little more runtime checking um, than us. For us, we really just do a static type. We'll see the implementation here a little bit later, and you can start throwing tomatoes at me, and you know I'm going to go hide in the corner, because there's some of the implementation I'm not a big fan of, but that's not important to my engineers. They only care about the final interface. Okay? So... For example, something like this, float f equals v, it's as if you cast it to a float manually. If you bring this out as an int, it's as if you cast it manually to an int. Okay? And whatever the C++ system would normally do when you do that cast, that's what we do. That's why I said, that's why it's the principle of least surprise. You would do what C++ would do if you normally did that conversion manually. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, these functions, are they actually in line? So yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, um, are these in line, and so will I get uh, a, a compiler warning? Um, they are in line. Uh, most of the stuff is in a, a .h file. It's actually kind of a big .h file. But um, I don't remember seeing any of the conversion types, but that might just because it's in sight, the, the way it's implemented, maybe the compiler can't quite detect it at that point. Yes, sir? Data loss warnings depend on inlining. 
Okay. Um, he, he was pointing out that he's never heard of a compiler who's... Say, say one more time. Conversion or truncation data loss warnings depend on inline. Right. Where, where the uh, conversion loss could depend on whether inlining is an inlining function or not. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. In, in trying to make your interface nice, one of the things you've done, though, is to turn an explicit cast into an implicit. Absolutely. Yes. So, in some way, it's actually more surprising to people that it, they're just getting a, a cast when they didn't intend to get a, a truncation of, you know. Okay, so I can say that this has never been a problem in the 10 years that this software library has been around. Um, I, I, people like this. My engineers seem to really like this. That's not necessarily a good answer because it's only a, a small group of people I work with. But um, that, that's the only answer I have for the moment. Okay. Okay, implementation. Like the valve constructor, the outcasts have to, we overload on all possible. Notice a lot of size T, eh? Size T. Okay. Otherwise, again, we'll run into massive compiler warnings. Okay, so uh, I'm going to put on my son. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, um, no, no, no. They're in there. The bull's in there. Oh, do I have explicit support for bull type? Yes. It's just not listed. There's also tab, string, some other stuff. I just, the slide gets bigger and bigger. So I wanted to, I wanted to get the idea across. Okay, so now I'm going to go slink off in the corner, put on my sunglasses, my trench coat, and expose the code. <sighs> the only, the, the major benefit of this is I control, first of all, I do do macros so that, you know, at least I have some, um, some handle on the complexity because we're doing this for every single uh, operator. Um, <laughs> the one benefit of this is I do have explicit support on how every single conversion could possibly happen. So if I really wanted to go out of my way to maybe, if, if enough users like, dude, we really want to have um, a, an exception thrown if you're going to lose a lot of information, I could add that to the code. Right now, this is really just doing, like I said, what C++ would do if you did the cast explicitly. Um, the, the, like, the, the one of the places, for example, this helped us, when you convert from a complex eight to a real, my engineers are like, do not do that conversion for me. Because do I want phase? Do I want magnitude? Do I want real? Do I want imaginary? Do I want mag squared? Do not do that conversion for me. I would much rather get an error. And actually, if you look at what Python does, if you try to convert a complex eight to a real, it throws an exception. Okay? So that's one of the places where we do not do something implicit that would actually lose information because basically two examples, my engineers and what Python does. Okay? No tomatoes? I expected at least a few tomatoes to be thrown at me from this slide. Okay. Can't bring food into the room. Oh, all right. <laughs> Got lucky. <laughs> Uh, please repeat the question. You can't bring food in the room. <laughs> yes, sir. I did have one question. Sure. Instead of having for each case return so and so, why can't you just, since you're all in the just type, just cast it to whatever you want and just return it, like case from S, small s all the way down to the union? Just do return u.s out of the union? Yeah, you can do that. I was actually trying to really point out that you're right. And the, the implementation is not quite like this. It's, uh, please repeat the question. Why couldn't you just say return u.s in all these places? Because um, uh, I wanted to make sure that I pointed out that this is kind of what C++ would do, you would, as if you cast it to an int explicitly. It's not quite what we do, and honestly, the compiler would just, you know, take care of that for you. But. So to answer your question, yes, you could do that. I guess I was doing this to just explicitly show that you do do an explicit cast like you would in C++. Uh, I think you were first, sir. Um, I'm wondering why you chose to um, do it this way, uh, where it's all implemented. You, like, all, there's a bunch of products in Twitter as opposed to using something like... Uh, Type info? Boost variant, for example. Um, as, as a, this work came out 10 years ago, so that's one answer. Second of all, remember, I'm trying to be very, oh, please repeat the question. Darn it, I'm so bad at that. Um, why did I not use something like boost variant? Uh, because, partly because this came out a long time ago, and it's, it's, it's been around, it's been in maintenance, ma maintenance? Maintenance for 10 years or so, so. Okay, uh, that's one answer. Uh, did, did, was there sort of a follow-up? Sound like there was a follow-up to that? No, I was just curious. Oh, okay. Uh, I think, st uh, st Stephen, you were next? So, I think you were just saying something about just returning u.s. It's a union, so u.s is, and it would cast it out to the int 4, but... You can't 
can't do that. It's undefined behavior to access something that was not what you put in. Oh, okay. There you go. So I guess that's why I did that. Uh, I think he was first and then Alistair. In, in regards to the boost variant question, you won't get the syntactic benefit out of it because you have to find a visitor if you want to do something like that. Ah, right. You can have one templated visitor for every single numeric conversion, for example. Yeah. Right, but you still have to have a visitor. You can't say, so what, well, he's doing syntactically assigned directly. You can't do that. Call the visitor inside the operator info. There's a lot of discussion here. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about here. Maybe with boost variant, you might be able to use the visitor to do this. Um, I, I think it's um, it's not clear what the answer is. Yes, sir, Alistair? The real reason you don't want to use boost visitor is your original position, that you don't want to have pointers to code. And the boost, visit, the boost variant destructor has to have a pointer to something that can destroy whatever user defined type went in there. You don't have user defined type. The destructor uses a switch statement as well. Just like the visitor. The, the destructor variant uses the visitor, which uses a switch. But the visitor also has virtual pointer table, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, which is one reason I couldn't use it. Oh, it doesn't? Not virtual about it. It's, it's a switch statement. It's a compiler generated switch statement. Okay, so um, the point is that um, there, there might be, there's discussion about the boost visitor, so <laughs> I don't know how to summarize that. Okay, um, limitations, this is actually, this, um, it was interesting to me that Alex noticed the same limitation he had too with his, uh, with his uh, var stuff. You can do this, you can create, um, you can create something, you can pull a string out, but this fails. Once you've constructed the string and it's, it's available and already it's about valid and constructed, this one fails if you try to do this operation because we get too many signatures interfering. So if you try to compile this code right here, you'll get a compiler error. It's like, oh, that makes me so sad because I wanted to be able to just pull stuff out of a val. For most of the stuff, it works. For the string, it doesn't. So how do we get around this? I'll, I'll show you my. It actually does work with, with some versions of some compilers. Oh really? Okay. The, 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 the same, but but no, it doesn't seem to be. I've I've seen it over, like I said, right at three, four, and five, and it seems like you always had to do this. My engineer is always like, Rich, I don't like this. Can you fix it? No, I don't control the string. So, uh, however, there's a very simple workaround. What I can do is I can force myself to call the user defined conversion. I don't want to. I don't really don't want to introduce something like as string or to string. All I simply do is put the constructor on. I'm going to construct a string from V. Ah, then you can use the user defined conversion, and it'll do the right thing. Okay. The other thing about this is. Um, this is actually kind of a useful idiom. I start looking in my, my engineer's code and I see this kind of idiom all over the code. You know, they'll pull a frequency and bandwidth out of um, some table somewhere. It's like, oh, I want to do some kind of limitation of the frequency and bandwidth. And so I just simply cast the freak out to real 8, add it to cast it out as the bandwidth as a real 8, and do the computation. This is a really easy way to get a value out inside of a major computation. You don't have to pull it out directly and then start using it. If you wanted to, just inside of a couple places, if you need to pull out a simple value, just give me the value. Give me what's in frequency as a real eight, even though let's say specifying it in hertz as an integer, you want to do the computation in real, real eight. Okay, so this idea is longer and uh, useful in longer code snippets. And I see my engineers doing this all the time. And they, they really like it, although some of them complain that if you do this too much, 30 minutes, thank you, um, it can be problematic. Okay, oh, good. so a quick summary of where we are. The C++ val is a dynamic container. It's easy to put stuff in. It's easy to take stuff out. And this really um, uh, is very parallel to how you do some Python. In fact, it feels like the only difference is, is the type over here on the left or is the type over here on the right? Okay. All right, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know people are going to get hung up in the implementation and I don't want that. So the next thing we're going to do is go to dictionaries, okay? Um, the tab is essentially an incremental hash table of key value pairs. You do lookups by values. I really only currently support strings or ints. There's some notion I should support tuples in the future, um, but you can't use dictionaries. At least that's what, um, Python has that restriction as well. But values, of course, can be any type of val. So this is the dictionary. Like I said, I don't want to go too much in the implementation. 
Uh, part of the reason I had a weird implementation, because M2K was a soft runtime system, we were trying to do soft uh, runtime and we wanted incremental data structures, so that's why we chose this. I know everybody likes their own version of the hash table or the, this version of the dictionary or this version. Should I have used unordered dict? Should I use map? Okay, I didn't want to talk too much about that. <clears throat> we also have the R, ARR. Okay, it's like a Python list, and a Python list is really just implemented as a resizing array, very much like vector. Okay. Um, this came out, again, this, this works actually, I leveraged a whole bunch of code from our M2K system, and we used the Rogue Wave interfaces. This is pre, like I said, this has been around, that's why I put the 1996 on the slide. So some of those interfaces I've kept, I really should probably sit down and retool this for vector, but backward compatibility is a bear. They started using it, but John's like, you know, I use your stuff in 40 of my systems, you can't change anything. Oh. Yes, sir. You're, you're golden then. Why is that? You say, he says, you can't change anything. You say, fine, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I do have a question in regards to the dictionaries. Uh, did you encounter the problem where you want to preserve the order of your entries in your structure? Uh, and then you don't have the kind of Okay. Have I encountered the, ooh, this is like a hot topic button for me. Um, did, did I encounter the problem where I want to preserve the order in my dictionary? Um, I did. Python has introduced something called ordered dictionary in 2.7, and I support that as well. I call it an O tab instead of a tab. I actually really think. <laughs> And by ordered, I mean the insertion order, not sorted order. But sort, that's what you mean, insertion order? You get, yes, you get dictionary with uh, A, B, C, you want it to, uh, with A, C, B, you want it to retain that. No? Yes. We, um, so we, we implement it just as, like Python does, the dictionary is a hash table, you don't necessarily know the order. The more I play with it, and the more I kind of look at the decisions, it always seemed to me like, a Python dictionary should preserve the order. It doesn't, but when you, bring, um, when you bring newbies in to learn Python, they always get confused. Why, when I look at my keys and I look at the dictionary, the keys are in a different order? And for a newbie learning Python, that's something that they don't quite get why we do that. Everybody in here understands it. It's all about speed. But it's one of those things where I kind of think the default implementation in Python should do that in order. JSON does not. For the longest time, I actually thought JSON did put them in order, but it really doesn't. The only data structure I know of, of all the ones we talk about, is XML. XML preserves order. It's, it's one of the things I like about XML, but it's like the only thing I like about XML, is that it preser preserves order. Okay? Python di uh, dictionary literal. It's surprising how useful it is to be able to specify a large dictionary. Okay, I look at my engineer's code, they really like that. So I'm gonna make it so you can do that too. Again, I know I messed up, I should probably should have called this dict so it felt more like uh, Python. So I was really hoping I could mess with C++11 literals and make this so cool and work, but they really are completely separate models. And so I cheated the dictionaries in a string. I know, I know, I cheated. I have a small little parser in here so I can pa uh, parse a Python literal and um, the, only, the one thing I will say about this is this allows me to cut and paste this dictionary and go back and forth between Python directly and I use the exact same syntax between them. Yes, sir, Stephen? So all you have to do is make a constexter and con then evaluate the commodifier. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Stephen pointed out that I could maybe do this as a constexter and have it evaluate at compile time. I have to look into that. That sounds really cool. Excellent idea. That's why I come to these conferences. Okay. Now, this is not a big deal is not, uh, in C++11 because we can use the raw string so we don't have to escape the quotes. But this was a big deal before this. When I first learned Python, I did not like that they use single ticks for strings. Single ticks and double, uh, double quotes both specify string. There's no notion of a char in Python. And at first I'm like, really? You couldn't do that, like C has been doing this forever, C++ is doing that forever. But the crazy thing is I actually started to drink the Kool-Aid and I like using single ticks for my strings now. And as, part, as ridiculous as it sounds, I don't have to hit the shift key when I do single quotes. And it also made it so that this literal is much easier to read than this literal. If, okay. You can also use the string continuation to make this look a little more nested if you like. Okay. 
All right, so that is um, some, of the, uh, some of the basics there. Let's talk a little bit about how we do insertions and deletions. Um, if this is the syntax we want to preserve, like we said, we want to try to make our stuff look like Python. This is how we do a lookup. This is how we do an insert in Python. Okay, so this is what we can write today, and this will work. We create our di uh, dictionary with our literal, and this will work. How does this work? This code is legal C++ down here, but it's doing an awful lot of work for us. This is a lot of syntactic sugar, taking advantage of a lot of type inference and static type features and the overloading options to get it so that this is really easy to do a lookup, but this is really what's happening if you were inside the debugger and you followed all the stuff that was going on, okay? What happens is we overload the bracket operator with a vowel. So what's going on here? We pass in this. Oh, that's not a vowel, but in one step, I can construct a vowel. That's this vowel right here. Then I can pass it to the operator bracket. D is overloaded, the operator bracket. And what does this return? This returns a reference to a vowel. And then I can just use operator less than less than, which is overloaded it on vowel as well. Very straightforward, right? Similarly for insertion, the same kind of idea here. The up, um, we do the D sub bracket. This returns a vowel ref. Ah, but now what we're doing is we're doing a vowel operator equal. So with a vowel operator equal, we have to turn this 5, 5 into a vowel. And so the final operation is copying this vowel into this vowel. And that does an insertion for us. I do. That, that takes no, no, it only takes a vowel. It can construct anything it wants into that vowel, the dynamic type, and that's why you have to create this extra vowel here. In one step, the operator equal can say, oh, I only have operator equal on vowel, and it, what it takes is a vowel. Sorry, the operator equal for vowel only takes a vowel. That's the only operator equal. Oh, you showed a bunch of overloads of the Oh, no, I'm sorry. If I said overload, I didn't mean that. I, I just meant that it would work for all that. I, I thought that might be a mistake on my slides. I apologize. Okay. So the question was, my slides earlier showed overload, but it's really one single overload for val, and then it does the one-step conversion from the int to the val. Sorry about that. That's, that's my mistake. Okay. I, I do want to talk about this because this is something that came up um, early in when we were, we were doing this. Python gives you the ability to distinguish between insertion and lookup when you're doing bracket operators. It's like underscore, underscore, get versus underscore, underscore, put. As we all know, um, if you, especially if you look at effective C++ item 30, you might think, can you overload and distinguish between lookups and assertions? You might think you could do it with the constants. You can't quite. But um, so w the way we got around this is we really wanted something to throw an exception. This is what Python does, is if you look up a key that's not there, it throws an exception. However, you still want to support this syntax because you want to allow insertion. Okay, the only way I could sort of see an easy way to support both insertion and lookup and still support the notion that if a key is not there, it throws an exception, is I force the user to use parentheses for lookups and brackets for insertion. Okay? I, I wish there were a better mechanism for this, but you know, I'm constrained. Like, yes, sir? So, the way it's done sometimes, which is ugly and has its own problem, proxy? Yeah, I wanted to stay away from proxy because uh, well, I talked about dynamic types 3.0 was the var. Th that guy returned a proxy, and it seemed to lead to all sorts of problems, which got in the way more than they helped. So this was sort of a recognition of that. But yes, absolutely, that's one way you could do it. Okay, not a huge fan of it, but we really wanted, all my users are like, don't ever make sure that I can always Finish my sentence, no. Um, make sure that um, I can throw an exception because I'll have a lot of code and I would much rather know that a key is not there when I look it up. And that is what Python does, okay? All right. Finally, the hardest part, and this is the piece that VAR, I think, really got right, um, the, the version 3.0 of the, the dynamic types I saw. We have to make sure we can do nested lookup and assertion. I said at the start of the talk, the whole reason for this work is I want to be able to do have my C++ system talk to my Python system, and I'm using dictionaries everywhere to communicate between different components of the system. 
as you start leveraging dictionaries more and more as the currency of your system, you start getting bigger and bigger dictionaries with more and more nested material. You need to make sure that it's very easy to get inside lookups and inserts into these giant nested tables. Okay, so uh, very s the key, uh, every, this is very similar to what we saw before. The key here now is we actually have overloaded val with operator brackets and operator parentheses. So what happens here is very similar to what we saw before, but you'll notice right here, we're calling operator parentheses on sub C, and sub C is a vowel. So what we've done is we've pushed up the operator brackets and the operator parentheses up to the vowel type so that we can support nested lookups. Yes, sir? Uh, yes, because I'm, if I'm doing a lookup, Sorry, yeah. If I if I'm doing a look, oh, uh, is that really? Oh, sorry, my bad, my bad. Uh, Alistair was pointing out that I might have been inconsistent, but uh, on this slide, I am at least using parentheses. Okay. Which would you rather write, this or this? You'd rather write this? I mean, I know a lot of people would much rather have everything explicit, but this is what I think my engineers prefer. Okay, and similarly for an in, uh, nested insert, of course here the brackets, operator brackets returns a val reference as opposed to a const val reference. Um, okay. Putting this all together, here's your C++, get inside, do a nested lookup, create a dictionary literal, pull something out, do something with it, and put it back in. Very similar to what the Python code does. You now have the ability to sort of manipulate dictionaries in C++ as easily as Python. Okay, questions about that? All this work, I know there's some clumsiness there. This was all about making the interface as easy as possible. Yes, sir, Steven, do you have a question? Oh, okay. So you might ask yourself, Rich, how fast is this? How does the C++ dynamic val compared to other dynamic languages, okay? We were, have you, have you guys all been to the uh, programming language shootout site? Really, no one's been there? Okay, a couple people. It's a really cool site. They have, like, solve this problem in like 10 or 11 different programming languages and let's compare the speed. It's actually a really cool site if you want to kind of get a sense of how fast languages are relative to each other, okay? We were hoping that there would be a benchmark on there comparing how fast hash tables are in different languages. Like, every single dynamic language we've ever encountered has the notion of, a, um, of that. We didn't seem to find anything on there, so we have to come up with our own metric for this. What we're going to do is we're going to compare CPython with our C++ val. For those of you who don't know CPython, this C Python has actually been around for quite a number of years, 20 to 30 years, I'm not quite sure the, the exact number depending on when you say um, uh, Guido started the language, but it's very stable. It's been hand optimized over, you want to say hundreds of years, but it's only been 10. Tens of years it's been hand optimized, so it's actually very fast, okay? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to compare our C++ val versus the C Python. Okay? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see how fast can we pickle and how fast can we unpickle. We're going to take a giant dictionary and try to pull out stuff, dynamic information, as fast as we can. That's what pickling is all about, right? Uh, pickling, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it's basically serialization. It's Python's notion of serialization. Okay? All right? Uh, and similarly, unpickle is the inverse of that. How fast can we create dynamic objects and insert them in a table? Ooh, I'm running out of time. <sighs> okay. Now, one of the things that, the first, your first thought might be, hey, Rich, Python is an interpreted language, and C++ is not. So you're going to kick its butt, right? Well, no. And this is not a failing on my part. What we're doing is we're going to call the hand-optimized C module. There's a module called C Pickle. It's written in C. It's been very well optimized. In fact, the latest version of um, Unladen Swallow found a lot of major optimizations to make pickling significantly faster. Okay? So what the C Pickle module does is it pickles at the speed of C. It iterates over Python objects and pickles at the speed of C. 
Similarly, the unpickle, it's actually uh, Lodes, I think, cpickle.lodes. It does the unserialization of a Python dynamic object at the speed of C. So this is a little bit more apples to apples than you might think at first. You're like, you think, Python interpreted, right? No, we really are trying to compare apples to apples as much as we can here. How fast can we pickle in C? How fast can we pickle in C++? Okay. And the table we're looking at is about 10,000 keys of varying types and lengths, and it's a relatively shallow table, but it does have a few nested dictionaries. Okay, um, we're running a little bit out of time, so let me uh, go to the important line. Pickle protocol 2 is the binary protocol. This is the one that almost everybody uses in the Python community. This is, uh, as of pickling tools 1.3.1, this is how fast I can pickle something. This is Python 2.7. This is the more, one of the most recent versions of Python with the optimizations from Unlaid and Swallow in there. Their pickling is about three times slower than mine. However, their unpickling is, you know, maybe a little, a little bit faster, 20 to 50% faster, depending on how you want to call that. Okay. The other numbers that you notice are actually relatively similar. Yes, sir? When you're pickling, is this just all in memory? Yes, it's all in memory. It's, you're doing a dump S, which is string. The question is, when I'm doing a pickling, is this in memory or across disks? It's, it's all in memory. Okay. Hopefully what you get out of this, I, I can leave this up if you, if you want to talk about it. But to roughly what you should get of this is that the, we're comparable. The C++ val is much faster at pickling. Uh, I think that's simply because it's faster to iterate over a complex table with our C++ structure versus the Python structure. But the Python C Pi object is much faster at unpickling. And there's one optimization they do inside the Python interpreter, or inside the C pickle stuff, that I can't do. Because Python has something called the global interpreter lock, there's only one thread that can ever be in the interpreter at one time. And so what they can do is they can cache most recently used versions of Pi objects. So they don't have to constantly keep constructing Pi objects. So they, they basically have a linked list of recently constructed uh, objects, and they can just keep reusing them. I can't do this because I can't take advantage of, I don't know if my machine's thread or not. Are you using a threaded application? I don't want to give up threading for the sole purpose of this one benchmark. So. Even though they're a little bit faster at unpickling, I know why. It's that one optimization makes all the difference in the world. Yes, sir. Have you tried to thread local cache? Uh, I haven't. I wanted to. Have I tried to thread local cache? I have not. Uh, partly because I haven't thought about it until now, and partly because I was trying to keep simplicity as well. So, okay. What hopefully you get from this is that our C++ dynamic vowels are on par with C Python's dynamic objects. Okay. The PrecHelp paper that I mentioned earlier, the one in 2001, when it compared all the different programming languages, it pointed out that of all the dynamic languages it was using, I think it was using Rex, Perl, Python, and Tickle, that Python and Perl were the two fastest of the programming languages. So that gives us some sense that we're doing pretty good. We're being one of the faster programming languages, and we're about at the speed of the C Python implementation. Okay. All right. So, on the bottom of the val package is a little surgeon's warning. Vowels cannot return hold user-defined types, okay? You can't hold, it's not like any, you can't hold anything in there. You can only hold, sort of like JSON, a, a composite of basic types, strings, Rs, and vowels, okay? So it's a very similar poly to XML or JSON. All types can be expressed as some composite of our primitive types, strings, and lists, so it's some combo of vowels. So this is a major failing of the val. Okay, what I have found, a, a, a relatively straightforward way to get away, uh, around this, is to consider making your class adapt to a val. Using the same techniques we discussed earlier, if you have a special constructor where you can create it from a val, which takes a, a Python dictionary and turns it into something, and then you have your internal structure, or if you wanted to export it using this, the user-defined conversions, okay? And if you can't, this is a little intrusive. If you wanted to, you could also write global functions to do this as well. And you might say, well, I don't really like this, and that's fine. I do want to point out, I, I did point out earlier, that in Python, almost everything is implemented as dictionaries, right? I talked about classes. When you pickle a class in Python, what it's really doing is taking the dictionary inside the class and pickling that dictionary, pickling that dict. So having the ability to go back and forth between dictionaries in C++ will make it actually a lot easier to talk to your Python interpreter, okay? 
one of the things by by turning yourself into a vowel you give yourself the ability to pickle you give yourself the ability to turn into XML you give yourself the ability to turn into JSON you give yourself the ability to print out in the pretty print that you can put in a file and do greps on so as soon as you embrace the vowel there's a whole bunch of other libraries that you can then leverage at that point, okay? And I'd, I'd say probably the biggest advantage is you can then pickle. If you can convert back and forth between your data structure and a vowel, you immediately can pickle and talk to Python and give it a dictionary, okay? But again, this is the surgeon's warning on the bottom of the box. Vowels cannot be used with anything, okay? Uh, related work, we talked a little bit about JSON, uh, representing dicks and looks in all language. I want to talk a little bit about XML. Um, I find that a lot of people use XML for real, when they really want key value dictionaries and lists. Okay? I think, you know how we talked about in, there was a love affair with XML um, inheritance when you first learn it, and then you kind of step back and realize what inheritance is for. You have a love affair with Python when you learn it, and you kind of take a step back and learn how to use it. I think XML was the same way. There was a period in the 90s and 2000s where there was a love affair with XML, and everyone wanted to use it everywhere. And then I think people took a step back and said, you know, for some stuff, maybe XML is a little too much, okay? Now, one thing I want to point out here is I've seen environments like Eclipse and NetBeans where they have these giant plugins that are outside the language for dealing with schema and XML. And it's part, part of me thinks to myself, if only they had an easier way to deal with dictionaries in C++, maybe they wouldn't have needed all this stuff to deal with XML as giant plugins in your environment. So, and that's, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe if we had these static dynamic, go ahead. I think, um, that's just not true. It, it isn't about dictionaries. It's about dynamic types. Like, you know, you know, oh, you mean this stuff or the XML? I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I don't get your point. Your last sentence on this slide, basically. If only key values were easy to deal with in statically high key value is not the Sure, you're, I, yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. This probably should have said, if only dynamic key value. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk real quickly about the, I think I'm running out of time here. The boost any is more general. It can hold any type. Okay. That's definitely its win over the vowel. Um, it does suffer from a slightly clumsier interface because it has to be more general. I get to be, I get to take advantage of all this stuff because I know I can only use a few uh, types on it. Whereas any has to be able to construct anything. Okay, so my stuff has been uh, designed to look like dynamic languages, whereas any is much more generic. Yes, sir. There was also one constraint that you faced there with the with the virtual <coughs> code. There's a virtual code inside any, so I guess that would be a problem. Right, right. Uh, the the any also has virtual pointers, which could be a problem if you want to do cross process shared memory. Okay, so this is what a cascade looks like with the vowel cascading insertion and, cur and cascading lookups. To do the same thing with an any is a little bit messier. Okay, so this is um, if you really are going to embrace. Lots of nested dictionaries. Um, I, I, I think we need to at least rethink some of the stuff with any, if, we, if, that's, if that's the direction of people want to go. But um, I don't really want to use nested dictionaries with any because it feels like they're a little bit much. Yes, sir. So that's, I mean, the, the purpose of any is basically to pay, say, hey, I've, I've, I have a library interface and I want the user to be able to pass a value through, mm -hmm. right? I get this opaque value at some point and had it handed back and the user says, yeah, I know that was this thing. Oh, I see, okay. Convert it back as soon as possible. And that's really the purpose of any, and not to have this dynamic variable feed. Okay. Uh, or variant. So his point was that a lot of people use, or most people use uh, any to just take a value opaquely through a system and get it out on the other end, and then you immediately get out the value because you knew exactly what it was. And its purpose was not to be for this. I guess it, it seemed to be when I was doing my you know, prior art lookup that this seemed to be the closest thing related. But I didn't know about Alex's stuff with Poco or his the stuff with, uh, what was it called again, lookup dynamic or? Well, Folly dynamic. dynamic. I didn't know about that work either, so. Okay, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, 
All this work has been done to support Python dictionaries in C++. All this work is available with an open source BSD license. It's been in constant maintenance over the last 10 years. Luckily, I've been able to work on contracts where I work, where I may have been, they've been um, nice enough to make me um, make this available to the general world. So it's under current maintenance, it's being used. Basically the, re, um, the purpose of this system was to allow C++ and Python to talk together using dictionaries as a common currency. Okay. Yes sir? Um, how does this compare to some of the functionality in Boost Python? Okay, Python right, there, there is a Boost, oh please repeat the question, um, there's, how does this compare to some of the functionality in Boost Python? Um, I started looking, there's a boost pickle library. Um, I started looking at it and I, honestly I couldn't get anywhere with it. And that's my own failing. I, I, I didn't spend enough time on it. I really at one point wanted to do a comparison of speed, see, you know, are they much better, much faster? I, I don't know. Um, there's the, the other boost Python stuff. I think it's more for doing like what the var 3.0 did, where I think it wraps the embedded Python interpreter and then it wraps it. So I don't know too much about that. I, that's about all I know about it. Okay. Yes, sir. Does your class support empty state? Yeah, there's a none. There's a none type. That, that's how you specify. That's the empty type in Python, and we support that as well. Please repeat the question. Does my stuff support the none? Yes, it does. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so a uh, question on the accessing model. I understand you've overloaded the parens for a, you know, a throwable if you're accessing something that's not there. Only an nested indexing chain. And of course, the, the brackets are there, especially for the insert. Use model, your engineers, you know, some languages like Perl, they're, they're very liberal. You can access something 20 levels deep and it's a read, so it doesn't create it. You can access 20 levels deep, it's a write, you do. Uh, do your engineers end up accessing with the square brackets? for a safe null value return when you go many levels deep? Um, I have seen some code like that. They, they take advantage that they know the bracket will create the none at some level, and then from then on they'll you know, do stuff with it. So I, they, they, they're aware of that, and they do in intermix the two for doing in lookups. Yeah. yeah. Mm, can you index a none safely with square brackets? I don't think I support that. Okay. Yes, sir. So you, you ran into a problem basically on the string assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, the multiple uh, conversion operator overloads. Right. Say, Got in the way. Yes. So, for example, the standard C math library, okay. pretty much every function is overloaded on float, double, and long double. Right, right. Don't you run into that problem constantly? So, I may imagine that doesn't a lot of code that your engineers use either look like Okay, we get a bunch of bars in, or, uh, and and first thing is we extract them all to properly typed variables, to, to primitives, and then do the calculations on those. Or you have explicit casts all over the place. It's it's a mix. It depends on what. Uh, the question is, what does your engineer's code look like? Um, do you have do you have a whole bunch of pulls out at one shot, and then do the stuff with the with the real types, or do you see sort of a mix like you did with the string? And it honestly, it kind of depends on how many things they're pulling out. I've seen a mix. It seems to be a mix of both, depending on what seems to be the easiest to express. My point is, I think that so if they do neither, if they just try to implicitly use conversion, I think they would get ambiguity errors all over the place, right? Um, say that again. So if they 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 get a value in, um, and and they're using it in some in some mathematical expression. Okay. Calling signs. Okay. Calling, for example, yes. Yeah, okay. They would get an ambiguity error unless they explicitly. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So Oh, so the, so the question is, if I call sign on a vowel, essentially, uh, what would happen? And you would get an ambiguity error because it's like, well, do you want to take the sign as a long? Do you want to take sign? Absolutely, you would get an ambiguity error. They've, they seem to be okay with that. They're, okay. There, there was one of some of my engineers asked me, hey, could you make it so that you could overload plus and all the op arithmetic operations for us so that you could do all the different kinds of things we could do? <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you did that. I use I use the script to generate the C++ code. Uh, could could, could um, Alex said he kind of does that in some of his stuff. We do that. Yeah, yeah they do that. I. Uh, 
I'm nervous when I hear that because at least with the vowel, I know what's happening when I do the conversions, when I get stuff out. If I start doing pluses with vowels and stuff like that, I'm really nervous that you'll start mixing complexes and doubles when you didn't mean to. I, I, I guess I would rather my engineers do stuff explicitly because that's what they care about at some point. Once they've gotten the values out and they're doing the real hardcore engineering, I, I almost look at the dictionary as like an interface. I, I'll, I'll, just a second, I'm sorry. Uh, as an interface, they get in the dictionary from Python, they get out the values you need, and then they pull out a few things into real eights, and then they start doing their real work. It's almost more like a it's a way to transfer information from one system to another. And I think once you've sort of gotten out of the vowels, you don't tend to use them from that point on. Tom. Yes, sir. Rob. So to Sebastian's point, I think the idea is that since ambiguity arises in many contexts, mm -hmm. and they have to do explicit conversions out of the vowel to mm -hmm. assign a, a specific type right. to then proceed, then why not make all of your conversion operators explicit and since you you know have to use older style C plus plus, then why not make them name operations rather than implicit conversion? I, I guess my, the best answer I have for that, why do I not just use explicit name conversions? Is I prefer to just do that rather than calling something like two real eight. I would rather see a type, a real type, rather than have to remember is it as real, too real, from real. Um, so, so, so uh, Rob's point was, um, if I have to do all these conversions anyway, why don't you just have an explicit conversion out? So that's my one answer. The second answer is you can. You can always just say dot operator double, and it'll. Yeah. So, did you have did you have something, Alex? Yeah, yeah. It was basically you can you can have the, the, the operator and then you can have a function to string or. Sure. I guess uh, Alex's point is that if you wanted to, you could have like a global operator or a, another function which does two string. I, I've seen enough code that I always forget, you know, I've gone to go up and forth between Java, C++, Python all the time. I'm like, how do they convert to string in this language? I don't remember. One of the things I like about this is you just say string. You don't have to say to string, as string, from string. You just go back and forth between the types. And maybe that's just a frustration I have that, um, you guys don't see as much as so. You, you can think of it in the way that you would provide a convenience for your users because they wouldn't have to use a cast or, or anything. It would be already there for them. If they right. Right. But okay. if you can use C plus eleven, then you can make them explicit. And oh, all that you've got still works. Oh, I'm sorry. When you said explicit, you meant the explicit keyword. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Yes, um, yes. I guess that that would be another way around it. His point that was we might be able to use the explicit keyword to make some of this uh, uh, a little bit better. We would disable all the implicit casts. Right. Okay. All right. Well, then, like, if there's any questions, thank you very much for your time. Oh.